Well, good morning to everyone. Um, please have a seat. Uh, welcome to SIPA, welcome to Columbia University. My name is Mauricio Cárdenas, and um, I am a professor here at SIPA, and I direct the MPA in Global Leadership, which is a new program that uh, SIPA is launching for mid-career students. It is a great privilege to introduce uh, this session uh, with Minister Mario Marcel and uh, with uh, Gray Newman. Gray is going to be conducting the conversation with Minister Marcel. Let me say two words about each one of them. Um, Mario Marcel is a longtime friend and uh, has a, an amazing CV. I think it's the dream CV of every single student in the public administration. He's a business engineer from the Universidad de Chile, has an MPhil from Cambridge University, um, and has a long career in public service. Uh, he's been uh, director of the budget in the Chilean uh, finance ministry. He's been board member of the central bank, president of the central bank, and since last year, minister of finance. Um, he's also held very interesting and important positions in the issues of institutions, governance, at the IDB, the World Bank, and the OECD. So you can uh, already see the breadth of his, uh, of his career and his experience. I think he's one of the very few persons I know that has worked in all these organizations. Um, uh, welcome to SIPA. It's a, it's a privilege to have you here. I want to thank the institutions that have made this event possible. First, uh, Invest Chile, uh, which is a great initiative to promote the capital markets in Chile. Um, very commendable. Uh, the Colombia Global Center in Santiago de Chile. Uh, ILAS, our Institute for Latin American Studies. Um, the Colombia Business School. And uh, our own MPA in Global Leadership. Um, and the students, uh, which are very important to have these events. And let me mention them by name, Juan Jose Silva, um, Diego Charlin, Lia Reich, and Juan Carlos Eizaguirre. So thanks uh, to you for your help and your collaboration. Um, Gray Newman will be uh, conducting the organization. Gray has been very close to SIPA, teaching uh, uh, a very popular class here. Uh, Gray uh, was managing director and chief economist for Latin America at Morgan Stanley, but he, had that, he held uh, that position as chief economist for Latin America uh, in a number of uh, banks like Bank of uh, uh, HSBC, uh, Merrill Lynch. Um, so uh, very knowledgeable uh, on the issues of the Latin American economies. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome both of you and, um, and we'll have you know, time for questions at the end of this uh, session. So Minister Marcel, once again, thanks so much for accepting this invitation. Thank you very much. Um, thank all of you for attending uh, the session this morning. Uh, the um, format is the following. We'll have a, uh, a brief conversation and then we'll open it up to your questions for the minister as well. And we'll conclude with a few remarks from Colombia's very own Mauricio Cardenas. Uh, Chile, for many years, I would describe Chile as the Chilean paradigm. The Chilean model was market-friendly economic policies, strong growth, macroeconomic stability. And that's the Chile that for, for decades I heard and studied. You don't hear much about the Chile paradigm today. Today, I would suggest the Chile paradigm has been replaced with the Chilean paradox. And the paradox is why, despite all of the policies put in place during the Chilean paradigm, we've seen the kind of social political upheaval uh, that led to the protest in 2019, led more importantly to a new constitution. And as you know, in the next 
little less than seven weeks, Chileans will be going to the polls to vote in favor, approval or rejection of the new constitution. And so the, the, the first question I have is, to, is for us to step back and look at what happened to the Chilean paradigm? Is it despite the policies, the Chilean paradigm, that we've, we've moved into the Chilean paradox? Or is it precisely because of some of the policies during the Chilean paradigm that Chile has arrived at the Chilean paradox? I always tell my students that before you can look forward to where we're headed, you need to look at what happened to bring us to where we are today. Uh, starting points matter. And so my first question is, is a little bit of a historical question. I'd love to get the minister's take on why is Chile where it is today? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Columbia University and, uh, and Siva for inviting me. I've been uh, here a few times before. I was uh, as uh, governor of the Central Bank uh, for the seminars organized by Guillermo Calvo with uh, central bank governors after uh, the annual meetings of uh, the IMF and the World Bank. So it's uh, great to be back. And uh, to share with you uh, some thoughts and some uh, uh, evidence and some uh, recent developments on Chile. Uh, and you uh, pose uh, this uh, question of uh, paradigm, uh, from paradigm to paradox. Huh? I think that uh, that is an, a very interesting uh, uh, headline. Um, I would, uh, well, this uh, would require perhaps uh, far more skills than uh, an economist may have. Uh, there have been uh, thousands of uh, uh, op-eds, editorials, books written about uh, the social upheaval of uh, 2019, so I don't intend to compete with that. Uh, what I would say is that uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, an economist, what uh, I could uh, see in that, uh, in that uh, process and then connecting to the current uh, agenda is that uh, um, Chile uh, since, uh, I would say, since uh, the middle of, uh, of the first uh, decade of this century, uh, began a process uh, whereby uh, this uh, paradigm was uh, increasingly challenged on a number of dimensions. And uh, to start with a very economic one, uh, what uh, you can see from the perspective of uh, economic uh, growth potential and economic productivity is that the growth potential slowed down from 5.5% uh, per year by uh, 2005 to 2.5% two, uh, 2 uh, today. So that's uh, three percentage points of uh, potential growth that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> disappeared during that time. And uh, then you can uh, wonder how that uh, happened. So part of that uh, had to do with, uh, with human capital, but the larger part uh, was uh, due to um, a, a deceleration and then extermination of productivity. Uh, if you average out uh, the last 10 years, average productivity growth is close to zero in Chile. Um, how did that happen? Uh, is that a result of uh, policies or uh, uh, misconceived policies or, or what? Uh, if you uh, trust, uh, I mean, I can rely on some work that we did at the Central Bank uh, a few years ago. And what you can see there is that, uh, first of all, uh, from the point of view of firms, um, productivity, the, the, the alternatives to, uh, to get the overall productivity to grow that is replacement of firms uh, or the, uh, the, the increasing gap between more productive uh, companies vis-a-vis -vis the uh, more stagnant ones, vis-a-vis -vis growth in uh, firms. It is this last component, the one that uh, contributes the most to deceleration of productivity. So in other words, you have different segments of the economy. You may have uh, firms entering and some others disappearing, but one important engine of growth, uh, of economic growth of, and uh, overall productivity, which is more productive firms growing faster than less productive ones is something that did not happen. 
Um, secondly, if you look at the labor market, uh, you can see that uh, in Chile, there is a lot of labor mobility. So for many years, uh, economists wrote papers about uh, how um, a severance uh, pay or whatever uh, a, a, a contributed to um, a weaken the labor market or weaken firms. But the evidence is that uh, that uh, <coughs> severance, severance pay costs uh, did not deter uh, firms and workers from uh, moving around. Actually, in Chile, about a third of the labor of workers, a third of workers, change jobs within a year. But what's, what is more important about that is that when workers change jobs, they don't necessarily move to better paid jobs, and they don't necessarily move to more productive jobs. They don't move necessarily to more productive uh, 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 companies. So there is a lot of movement within the economy, but uh, somehow there, is, uh, there are a number of uh, barriers to get the normal processes of, uh, of uh, productivity growth working. And finally, you have uh, natural resource-based industries, starting with mining, uh, where on the one hand, you have a, a, an almost uh, you know, um, uh, physical factor of uh, declining productivity of uh, mines, the older they get. Uh, but, uh, um, but also you have uh, industries that are very intensive in water, very intensive in energy, and uh, sometimes uh, it can be uh, very polluting. So um, increasingly, the, some of the most dynamic sectors in the economy began to hit some of these constraints, constraints that had to, be, to do with the quality of, uh, the quality of life uh, and the use of the natural resources for a number of purposes different from uh, only uh, mining or other activities. So what uh, that uh, suggests is that uh, the way we were growing over time uh, it, it became increasingly exhausted. And then that uh, we, needed, uh, to, uh, we needed some uh, kind of uh, change that could uh, diversify our production to generate a renewed in, uh, insertion into the world economy, being an open economy as we're still today. Uh, um, part of that is happening. Um, if uh, you think of uh, Chile 20 years ago, uh, we were heavily dependent on uh, imported oil and, uh, uh, and uh, fossil fuels. Uh, we were entirely dependent on that. We had a couple of crises in between with the, with the import of uh, gas from Argentina. Uh, we had a number of episodes like, like that. But uh, uh, 10 years ago, our energy matrix started uh, to change. And today, uh, from a time when about only 5% of our energy came from uh, renewable sources, we are already at uh, 25. And in the next uh, five to seven years, we will uh, get to 50%. Uh, that is because technology has evolved in a way that it makes uh, uh, solar power and uh, wind power uh, much uh, uh, cheaper to produce. And then uh, uh, we may end up in 10 years from now from uh, being entirely dependent on, let's say, dirty sources of energy into being entirely uh, dependent on the clean energy sources and we may become even an exporter of energy. Uh, so uh, that is what may be opening ahead. Uh, so what, the, what I, I want to uh, convince to you with that is that uh, uh, Chile is in a, is in a, a very uh, important transition on the basis of uh, its uh, production, on its uh, economic basis, that is not a negative transition uh, but uh, uh, that, uh, in the middle of that, when uh, you are still uh, trans transitioning towards a different uh, base for, of uh, production, uh, you, you hit a number of uh, bottlenecks, you remain dependent on, uh, on imported oil. We are now, as we are now. Uh, so um, this uh, slower growth 
uh, zero productivity growth is something that uh, uh, keeps resources flowing into the country, into society to resolve uh, social problems that they accumulated over time as well. Mm -hmm. So I will give that uh, very, uh, that perspective from a very, uh, from, the, from the point of view of an economist uh, that uh, suggests that uh, Chile, uh, Chile's uh, growth slowed down, not because of bad policies, but because essentially our uh, a basis for uh, producing and growing in the past became increasingly exhausted. But the good thing is that at the same time, new avenues open, and we, we are currently in that transition. So it's no wonder that uh, today uh, uh, foreign investment is still welcome in Chile, uh, probably more welcome than before, because if, you want to, if we want to move towards uh, clean energy, green uh, industries, and so on, there is a lot of know-how that comes with uh, foreign investment. Uh, um, when uh, I receive lots of investors that uh, have a number of projects in these uh, new areas, um, uh, Chilean uh, entrepreneurs that are uh, building successful businesses on areas that uh, you wouldn't dream of in the past, uh, built on the basis of uh, knowledge, built on the basis of logistics, uh, built uh, on the basis of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, research and development. Uh, some of them are uh, even got to Wall Street and they raised capital here, not uh, uh, in Chile because there was not enough capital for them. So uh, we are in that process. So we will feel some of the strains of that for a while. But, uh, but it's important uh, to see that uh, the future ahead of us is not a mirror image of the past. And that, uh, that we, uh, all of us have to learn uh, to live in a different economic and social environment from the one that we were familiar with. You mentioned living in a new environment. A new environment brings with it at times um, uh, a level of uncertainty. And one of the issues when I speak with, uh, with investors and others in this area is the uncertainty over the constitutional process. And uh, it's six, seven weeks before a vote takes place. Um, there have been increasing questions over if the constitution is not passed, if it is passed, what happens next? leaving the constitution aside for a second, but the uncertainty that this process creates, what, what tools, what is, what is the role of the finance minister and what can the, the ministry do to deal with that level of uncertainty and how would you handicap that, that uncertainty? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I, uh, countries have a constitutional processes uh, once every several uh, generations. Uh, so uh, when I was uh, born, not, uh, uh, not uh, too close from now, um, the, uh, pre the previous constitution was uh, only uh, uh, 45 years old. Um, and, uh, uh, and then in, 19, in 1980, uh, I voted in the plebiscite that was organized by, by the Pinochet government. Of course, I was uh, with, the, uh, with the losing vote. Uh, but I remember that at that time, the demand for an open and democratic constitutional process was already there. And we are uh, talking about 1980. Huh? Our uh, President uh, Boric, uh, 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 recall the uh, President uh, Frey Montalva's words in uh, 1980 at uh, one uh, gathering at, uh, at, uh, in Santiago uh, to reject the proposal of the constitution from the dictatorship. Um, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, pretty uh, interesting that in Chile this uh, uh, social upheaval uh, ended up uh, or uh, moved towards uh, an institutional process to build a new constitution, something that you don't find in many places. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some people say, well, this was the political system that uh, tried to resolve this in the way that they knew. 
uh, but the, the political agreement was uh, pretty pretty broad, and the and the people understood that, that and supported that. Um, in the in the um, referendum of uh, 2020, um, uh, 79 percent or 78 percent of the people voted for a new constitution. Uh, in a constitutional process. And now, if you trust the polls, uh, support for the new constitution, adding up people that are in favor of the proposed constitution, people that are in favor but would like to see further changes, and people that would like to reject but to restart the constitutional process is larger than it was in 2020. The reject vote today in the polls from people that they want to remain with the current constitution is lower than it was in the referendum of 2020. Today, it's 18% compared to 22% in 2020. So even after all uh, you know, the complexity of the constitutional process uh, and the, uh, well, the, the way people saw uh, uh, the constitutional body to uh, behave and so on, even after all that, even after discussing things that were not uh, common in our constitution, still people want a new constitution. And that uh, will be the result of, uh, of, the, of the referendum in September the 4th. The result of the referendum is that uh, we are going to have a new constitution, either the one that was uh, approved uh, or proposed by the constitutional body, either that with some amendments or a new process that will lead again to a new proposal. So uh, I think that's something that you can bet very safely on. Now, what can uh, a Minister of Finance uh, do in this uh, environment? Uh, well, we have to ensure that, uh, that they given all the expectations that are set on that uh, process, not only on the constitutional process, but also on this uh, new administration from uh, four months ago, uh, uh, you need to ensure that uh, this uh, a, a change that people expect is done in, a, in an effective, uh, structured, and sustainable way. Uh, we in Latin America have uh, plenty of experiences of uh, attempts at, at reform that failed because either the economy uh, a, a moved into a crisis or because uh, um, the public finances were unable to fund the benefits or, or the cost of uh, reforms. Uh, so that's uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, I believe that the Minister of Finance can do. That is what uh, we have been doing and we have been managing at the same time uh, a difficult economic uh, juncture at the time when uh, you know, we're discussing whether the world is uh, heading to another recession. Uh, and at the same time, we are fostering and uh, supporting an agenda for, for change, uh, like uh, the tax reform that we submitted to Congress uh, 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 three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. on, the, um, on the issue of the, of the tax reform presented to Congress, I think at the beginning of this month, how important is that when we think of the social programs that have been discussed in the context of the, of the new constitution and in terms of the goals of the administration, um, how, 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 yeah, how important would you say the, the tax reform is? And if you could talk a little bit about maybe some of the main, you know, the, the highlights without going into a full presentation on tax reform, because I've got a dozen more questions. Sure. Yeah, uh, well, tax reform is uh, expected to raise uh, public uh, tax revenues uh, by uh, some 4% of uh, GDP by uh, 2026. Um, that, uh, uh, what that means for the government's program, that uh, is equivalent to about 50% of, uh, of the government's program, including uh, the increase in, in basic uh, pensions, uh, health uh, reform, um, building of schools, uh, building um, a, a care uh, system, and then all the efforts uh, to support small and medium enterprises, to diversify uh, production, to do research and development, and so on. 
Um, so it's 50% uh, of the cost of, uh, of the government's uh, program. Uh, the other 50% uh, would uh, come basically from the fiscal space that we have uh, uh, that we have created um, uh, in the next uh, few years on the basis of a, a responsible management of uh, public finances and some efficiency gains uh, from public expenditure. Uh, now, what are the main features of uh, tax reform? Uh, well, first of all, it's a very ambitious one in terms of uh, tax revenue, uh, but it, it appears that uh, that is uh, uh, perhaps uh, a challenge uh, uh, that uh, uh, reflects uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, people's uh, needs. Um, after many years where the tax burden in Chile has not uh, grown at all. Uh, the last time uh, tax burden uh, grew was back in 1990 in the reform that was introduced by the new democratic administration in, at that time. After that, uh, uh, the tax burden has uh, remained around 18% of GDP going up or down, depending more on the denominator than, rather than the numerator of that, uh, of that uh, ratio. Um, uh, with that, uh, Chile, uh, in Chile, tax burden has uh, grown uh, more slowly than in the rest of Latin America, and we have a gap uh, of about 8%, uh, 8 percentage points of GDP uh, to the uh, OECD uh, median. And that the gap is uh, explained mostly by personal income tax, that in Chile collects only 1.5% of GDP compared to more than 8% of GDP in uh, uh, OECD countries. Uh, so this uh, tax reform is uh, focused on uh, individual uh, taxation, uh, personal income tax, uh, wealth tax. Uh, then it includes a number of uh, provisions uh, to improve the, the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, tax collection, reducing uh, tax avoidance, tax evasion, uh, cutting down some uh, tax exemptions. Uh, then uh, we have a, a royalty on a redefinition of the royalty on mining, and finally a package of, uh, of uh, uh, corrective uh, taxes that uh, will be submitted later in the year. Um, and uh, within that, uh, perhaps the, the one uh, component that, that I would uh, uh, underscore the most is the change to uh, income tax, because uh, for nearly 40 years we have struggled with this uh, uh, issue of uh, integrating or not integrating corporate taxation with uh, personal income tax on dividends. Um, uh, uh, that uh, began to change uh, back in 2014. Then we moved to a semi-integrated system that was not, uh, I think, a very effective response because uh, it uh, made tax compliance considerably more uh, complicated. So now, instead of uh, uh, continuing that in those uh, dynamics, we are moving towards a dual system whereby you tax differently uh, in, uh, uh, income from capital as compared to income from labor. And for dividends, we will apply a flat rate of 22% uh, 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 combined with uh, a, a corporate tax rate of 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, if approved, that would create a structure where, uh, upon which we can build uh, in the future uh, without uh, going back into this, uh, uh, this uh, dynamics of combining taxes uh, to uh, make uh, uh, policy decisions, which I think is, is uh, very complicated. Uh, and uh, that has, that, I mean, it may have been very useful in Chile back in the 1980s, where uh, uh, funding investment from corporate savings was the only way to fund investment because uh, the financial sector was in ruins after the, the 82, 83 crisis. But now that we have a, 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 a fully operational and effective financial system that is not needed anymore. When you look at the, you, you mentioned the, the difficult economic juncture that Chile finds itself in, and that as a policymaker, you find 
presenting the tax reform in this context, what concerns you the most about the Chilean economy in this current conjuncture, in this current moment? What, what is it from a policymaker perspective, putting the hat on as the finance minister, previously putting the hat on as the president of the central bank, what's the, what's the most concerning element in the near term for Chile to resolve as opposed to the longer term, which the tax reform is, is intended to address? Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, today um, the world is uh, experiencing a sort of aftershock after an, a 7.5 earthquake. Uh, in the case of Chile, that is not 7.5, but probably 8.5 earthquake because it will combine with the social crisis of uh, 2019. But uh, in addition uh, to the severity of the, of the crisis, uh, I think uh, some of the issues that we face today have to do with the, uh, the way in which um, the previous government uh, or the, the, that we, uh, fr between Congress and government, sorted out or tried to support uh, people uh, to get out of the crisis. Um, in 2021, uh, Chile had the most expansionary fiscal policy in the world. Uh, 2021 it was more far more expansionary than 2020, even though the bulk of, uh, of the crisis was, uh, was in 2020. And that combined with this pension fund uh, withdrawals uh, that uh, uh, added up alongside the, the tax uh, uh, or government transfers added up to some 25% of GDP. So within a year, uh, with um, pension fund withdrawals and massive government transfers, uh, we put 25% of GDP uh, into the economy. And of course, the economy recovered fast, but then overheated. Um, and then now uh, we have to face the current inflation pressures coming from the factors that are common to many other countries, alongside having to cool down the economy because of this uh, uh, prior overheating. Uh, so um, you see what you see is um, inflation pressures that have combined uh, together uh, to generate 12.5% uh, inflation in the latest uh, reading, uh, a very large uh, uh, current account deficit uh, last year, was it was uh, close to 7% uh, of GDP. Uh, and then you have to uh, cool down uh, the economy at a time when there, when, there are, when there are many other risks around us, uh, because uh, the world is uh, un under a contractionary shock. There is no question about that. So uh, we need to articulate, on the one hand, the macro policies to uh, secure uh, uh, restoring a macro, uh, a macro equilibrium with a contractionary monetary policy and with a very substantial fiscal consolidation uh, with mechanisms to support uh, people that, uh, that they will be uh, exposed uh, to uh, the larger costs from, uh, for that, from that kind of uh, uh, adjustment. So, Inflation takes a heavy toll on, uh, on wage earners. There is no question about that. Um, job losses are not there yet, but uh, usually, as you know, the labor market tends to respond <coughs> to the to economic activity with, certain, with a certain lag. So we, will be, we are dealing with that. And the, the good side of it is that we started much earlier than other countries in the US. The Federal Reserve started raising the policy rate uh, back in March after many months of arguing that the inflation was only transitory, that the, that the averaging out uh, over uh, a long period of time would be enough, and so on. But uh, it ended up raising the policy rate in last March. Chile started in July 2021, so it has a, a nine-month lead over the Federal Reserve. This consolidation is not happening in many countries uh, yet. In Chile, we moved from a, a government deficit of 7% of GDP uh, last year to a zero deficit this year. 
Uh, so we are doing our, our job. That would help uh, uh, <clears throat> the economy to adjust uh, faster. But at the same time, uh, we need uh, to support uh, people. Uh, and uh, we are uh, just uh, about to approve uh, uh, one of a transfer to uh, households belonging to the poorest 60% of the population. But, uh, you know, it, it is interesting that uh, in Chile, there are people that think that uh, we shouldn't do that and we should do further consolidation. They don't even acknowledge that that is already happening. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I think that the, that's, a, that's a way of dealing with this uh, juncture. Of course, it's a very narrow path. Uh, it's not very easy to get the, the right balance. Uh, in the course of that uh, path, but uh, it is important that we have the right, uh, at least the uh, the right uh, uh, the right uh, analysis or the, uh, the right uh, if, a picture of what is uh, going on. Thank you very much. the um, The title of this presentation was "Chile at the Crossroads: the, A Path to Inclusive Development," and my. Um, Hearing you, the, the path seems, as you described it, narrow indeed and significantly a challenging one. I just hope it's not a tight rope. I'm glad you did use that as the, as the metaphor here. So I've got um, a dozen more questions that I um, wanted to ask, uh, but in interest of all of you here today, I'd like to turn it over to the students and those who are attending this morning to have a chance to, um, to ask uh, a question of the, of the minister. We have a few minutes to do that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Marcel, for your, for your thorough uh, presentation and, and conversation. Uh, I just had one question. Um, <laughs> I guess it is a role of every policymaker uh, to put him or herself under different scenarios, right? So my question is, um, if you have thought of, uh, of, uh, of a scenario where the tax bill that you are presenting to Congress is significantly smaller, or in other words, given that you have outlined the challenge of building this, uh, this scheme of social support for the population for the long term for Chile what, have, what would happen if you wouldn't get an outcome as the one that you're expecting after this tax bill is induced are there alternatives what would be uh, the, the position of the Ministry of Finance with regards to that um, thank you well I think that uh, if you're uh, if you're relying uh, uh, <clears throat> on uh, tax reform to provide the 50% or half the funding for uh, the government's program, if you don't get, get any, uh, if you don't get any reform through, you would have uh, half the money, and you can only do half uh, our agenda. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are ways. Uh, I mean, there's still uh, something that uh, that uh, you could uh, grasp uh, from uh, uh, some uh, further. Uh, uh, efficiency gains uh, in the public sector, but uh, something that I would not risk uh, would be to uh, increase uh, uh, the public deficits and public debt. Uh, we are at a position that is uh, better than in other emerging countries uh, with a debt of 38% uh, of GDP right now, um, a little less, uh, probably nine, seven to eight per, uh, percentage points less if you, uh, if you net out with, uh, with uh, sovereign wealth funds. Um, but, uh, but I think that uh, moving uh, above that is uh, very dangerous. Um, it's very dangerous in the sense that uh, Chile is an investment grade country. And if you lose uh, that, uh, well, everything will, be, uh, uh, will become uphill, will be considerably more expensive to borrow for firms, uh, to government, um, and the economy, there is no question that the economy will slow down. Huh? So we have to be uh, um, thoughtful of, uh, of uh, keeping uh, ours as a low risk economy, 
because that has a number of uh, longer term benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, I don't think that, I mean, uh, an outcome like that, uh, I think that is very unlikely. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I trust, uh, first of all, that after the social crisis, uh, many people from different parts of society, uh, including, um, including uh, uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs, employers, and so on, acknowledged that it was necessary to make an effort to provide the resources uh, to fund uh, uh, social services and, uh, and to resolve many uh, of the people's needs. So I, I hope that that will show up in the course of a, a tax reform discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, um, you, you spoke of, uh, you know, the Chilean uh, paradigm. Uh, there are many features of that paradigm that uh, stay today. One of those is uh, fiscal discipline uh, and the macro uh, uh, and the respect for, for macro equilibria. And uh, if you think that, uh, if you look for uh, recent uh, uh, demonstrations of that, I think that the rejection of the fifth withdrawal of pension funds is a very clear one. Uh, you had, I mean, members of parliament had in front of them the most uh, tempting uh, gift, which is, you know, that just by pushing a button, you would put uh, 4 million pesos in the hands of uh, many Chilean households. But, uh, but uh, in the end, people realized that, uh, that the dangers for the economy were far greater, that, they, that uh, a measure like that would do more harm than good. And they, they rejected that by uh, an overall majority for the first time in two years. Mm -hmm. So I, I very much uh, trust that, uh, uh, you know, with uh, enough uh, cooperation, uh, flexibility and so on for, from all sides, we will get the uh, tax reform through. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you can, the voice, the spokesperson of the chat. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello? hello? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Minister, for your participation in this, in this presentation. Um, so I would like to get a little bit more in depth in the in the tax reform, particularly in the royalty per mining, particularly considering the topic of the paradox that we've been talking. Um, number one, we know that currently we don't have enough supply to fulfill energy transition regarding the demand that it requires, right? For 2040, we will need four times the amount of essential base metal commodities to fulfill energy transition for sustainable development. Moreover, companies such as BHP have announced $10 billion of investment in Chile. And so regarding the paradox and the effects that a royalty in the mining sector will cause, considering um, the competitive position of Chile as a mining country, right? And the, and the effects that it will have also in the reserves of ore that we have in our country as well. I would like to get your take on how this will affect the competitive position that Chile currently holds as a mining country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, royalties, uh, I mean, has a, a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, features. Uh, royalties exist because uh, what you are trying to do is uh, to uh, change the distribution of, uh, of economic rent uh, from the exploitation of uh, non-renewable natural resource. Right. Uh, so there are many ways of articulating that. And uh, of course, you're not alone in the world. There are other countries that apply the same. Uh, so uh, what, uh, uh, and as you know, we have a, 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 a mining a royalty on mining since uh, 2005. So it should be clear from that experience that uh, introducing a royalty as such it's not an impediment uh, to uh, uh, investment per se. It has more to do with the way it is designed, the, uh, the size uh, of it, uh, and the comparison with other countries. Uh, so um, what we have uh, proposed is uh, something that combines an ad valorem component with a, a, with a, a royalty on the 
um, operational margin of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, mining uh, companies. Um, whether the, we stroke the right balance or not, whether we have the right basis for that uh, by making it dependent on the price of copper, or as a company suggests, dependent on uh, different uh, 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 degrees of uh, or size of uh, operational margins is something that is open for discussion. We uh, do not uh, claim to have the final word on that. The final word will come once uh, we get uh, through the, le the legislative uh, process. So we will be very happy to learn exactly what is in that uh, design that may uh, deter uh, investment. And uh, we will see if there, uh, there is a room for adjustment. Uh, for us, the important thing about, uh, about the royalty on mining is uh, to um, rebalance uh, this, uh, this distribution of economic rent uh, towards uh, the country as a whole and to use the, those, uh, the proceedings from, the, from, those, uh, from the, the mining royalty to fund a regional development, to, find, uh, to fund research and development, uh, and a number of things to uh, uh, contribute to make the Chilean economy more competitive and more productive. That is uh, the purpose of what we're doing. If, uh, if uh, uh, we find an alternative design that uh, takes us to the same result, we will be very happy to take it. Well, let me um, read a few of the questions that people are watching this uh, through uh, Zoom. Um, I'm gonna select a couple of them. Felipe Vial asks the following question. Minister Marcel, last week I saw a presentation of Undersecretary Sanuesa and she showed a slide with the diagnostics used to propose a new tax reform. One of the points showed was the gap in personal taxes between Chile, 1.5% of GDP, and the OECD average, 8% of GDP. So why not tax everyone? I think this goes to the question of the tax base for personal income tax. And a question uh, by Juan Carlos Dominguez on whether a new constitution is really the answer to the social problems Chileans are facing. Uh, let me just leave those two now. Yeah, uh, so uh, starting with the tax reform, um, the gap between uh, Chile and OECD countries um, has a, a number of uh, factors explaining that. Of course, the, 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 the size of the tax base is one. Uh, and we know that uh, in, in Chile, we have an exempt um, minimum that, uh, that is uh, relatively high in absolute terms compared to advanced uh, economies. It's not just uh, relative, uh, 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 it's not just relative to their uh, per capita income, but it's uh, also uh, higher in absolute terms. Uh, now, of course, that has a lot to do with the with the tax history of the country, uh, ours, and the uh, and the advanced uh, economies. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is not comparative statics. This is, I mean, it's, you cannot just jump from one place to another without acknowledging, uh, you know, the fact that uh, in uh, advanced economies, people are prepared to pay tax because uh, all of them get uh, some kind of uh, benefit uh, uh, from the government, some kind of uh, service from the government. But we have lived uh, over many years with uh, uh, targeted uh, social policies uh, that was necessary at the time when you had very limited resources. Uh, so um, I, I think that uh, in order to move to a broader tax base, you need first, uh, uh, prior to that, you need to show uh, people that uh, they uh, can share on the access uh, to um, government uh, services and that they can get the uh, quality services. Uh, and only after that, uh, I believe uh, 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 you could think of uh, broadening tax base. I think that you cannot do that on the, only on the basis of uh, promise. Um, so that uh, will be, I think it's, it's a challenge uh, for the future. It's not for this uh, tax reform. 
But if we do not uh, change uh, income tax in the way that we are proposing here, you will not uh, get uh, to the broadening of the tax base either. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot uh, tell people that uh, they will start paying income tax while at the same time, uh, 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 people in the upper uh, brackets of income uh, pay lower tax. They pay lower VAT tax compared to their income. Uh, usually, um, uh, they can take advantage of, uh, or I mean, uh, many of them, uh, you know, have a structure, uh, um, have structured companies and societies and corporate structures that uh, lead to, to lower uh, tax payments. I mean, that's not something that, uh, I mean, it's, what I'm describing is not a sin. I'm not uh, uh, criticizing people uh, for that, but uh, what I'm trying to address is the political economy of this. That is that uh, if you're going to tell uh, people that uh, they will have to start paying income tax, you have to ensure uh, people that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, <coughs> richer households also pay income tax and that they, and probably that they pay a higher proportion of their revenue in income tax. Uh, at least that is what uh, we um, collected from uh, our uh, 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 social dialogue prior to uh, submitting these uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as people see fairness and reciprocity from the government, the easier it would be uh, to broaden the tax base. And then on the constitution as a solution to people's problems, um, I think that, uh, you know, at least uh, what the uh, polls tell you is that uh, uh, people do not expect the miracles coming from, uh, from a new constitution. Uh, uh, as the process has evolved, uh, people have realized that uh, there are a number of uh, deeper institutional issues built into a constitution. Uh, one of the most uh, heated discussions were not about the uh, social rights, were about the political system. And that was one of the most uh, contentious, uh, contentious uh, episodes of, uh, of, the, of the constitutional process. I remember when this all started, uh, you know, many people said that, uh, you know, the greatest uh, danger uh, for the constitutional process was that the central bank could lose its uh, uh, independence. And at that time, I said, you know, look at the Constitution. Central Bank is two articles, uh, you know, compared to a whole chapter on, uh, on the political system, the structure of powers of the state, and so on. You let this process move ahead, and you will realize that that will be the heart of the constitutional discussion, not the, the independence of the Central Bank. And that is what actually happened. In the end, Central Bank ended up with a, with a set of rules that are pretty much the current ones. Uh, uh, the, um, the two, what is it contained in those two articles in the current constitution, plus a few issues taken from uh, the constitutional law of the central bank. But, uh, but uh, uh, the political system, the structure of powers, of course, that took a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, energy um, in the uh, constitutional convention. And uh, some people that uh, don't like what came out, uh, don't like precisely the political, the, the proposals on the political system, uh, the structure of uh, the legislature, uh, the re-election of uh, presidents, uh, something that is uh, not uh, common in our political uh, tradition. Uh, so in the end, it was, uh, it was not the promises of benefits or immediate uh, benefits, what has a, uh, a, a captured the constitutional discussion, but rather the essence of any constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to bring this to an end. But before we do that, let me say uh, two words. Uh, paradigm or paradox? Uh, let's look at the, um, at the key features here. A progressive when an outsider president is elected uh, with an agenda that is uh, um, a clear mandate to reduce inequality. A high-flying technocrat is appointed as finance minister that gives comfort to, to markets and to business. 
a tax reform is proposed ambitiously with the idea of increasing revenues by say four or five um, percent of GDP. That's unheard of in uh, recent times. That is not just Chile. That's just also what happened in Colombia. So maybe we're in search of a new paradigm here. The paradigm of how to um, run governments with a more inclusive agenda, um, bridging inequalities, uh, giving the state more capacity, especially on the fiscal front, but at the same time, providing comfort, stability to markets and to investors. That's, that's the new paradigm. Uh, Mario Marcel is, uh, is perhaps the person uh, trying to build that because being a finance minister in this environment is not, uh, it's not an easy uh, challenge. Uh, finance ministers always have, always have a difficult job, but being at the crossroads of an ambitious progressive agenda with um, groups in government that had been historically underrepresented, but uh, that have big aspirations and big ambitions. Uh, but of course, there is always limited resources. Um, and also at the same time, understanding that to fulfill those expectations, you need more revenues. There's nothing more tense and difficult in the job of finance minister than enacting tax reforms. This is a contact sport, but what leaves you with more bruises is tax reforms. And I can tell you, being an observer of the tax systems in our region, that this idea of moving directly towards a dual system between the corporate income tax and the dividend tax is the right one. So I commend you for, for doing that. I think that's, that's, the, that's the necessary step. Um, I was finance minister in Colombia when we introduced the dividends tax and it was a very hard and difficult issue. And it was just a 10% dividends tax. Now you're thinking about going to 22, if I heard that well. Um, at the same time, you have to keep um, investment flowing because that's, a sen that's essential to this, uh, to this new paradigm. And that means uh, having the private sector engaged. I think that's the, that's the one aspect that is, uh, is, is most important. I think that's the reason why you're here in New York, uh, to give that type of confidence. Um, my view is that um, for that to happen, clear message, well articulated is, is central. So this is important for our students. Um, explain well, um, but at the same time, you need to avoid mistakes. You need to avoid making announcements that are half cooked, that are preliminary. Uh, you, you need to avoid responses that are dramatic, like what happened with the exchange rate last week. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's important that uh, that uh, you provide some stability. I also think we didn't touch on that. It's not your current area because it's, uh, it's the central banks, but I think what uh, Chile did to stabilize the exchange rate um, was remarkable. It's also part of a paradigm where central banks intervene when they need to. And uh, what we have seen with the exchange rate in the past few days, I think it's also an important. So it's a paradigm in construction and it couldn't be in better hands than with uh, Mario Marcel at the helm of the Ministry of Finance in Chile. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for your support.